Rodrigo can talk a little bit about our involvement in culture here in San Miguel because we were running the Baroque We Created and we were the directors of the Baroque Music Festival here in San Miguel because we both love uh, music and arts and culture in general, but particularly we saw in a, an area that wasn't being addressed. We have the Chamber Music Festival. We have several jazz festivals. We have lots of festivals here. But no one was talking about Baroque music, even though San Miguel is a Baroque town. So we like, we have these spaces that would be wonderful in this town. Let's just use them. And so uh, the concept was born. We were both on the board of Pro Musica for a while. And um, they were having their concert series every year. And nobody was thinking about Baroque music. And we just said, let us try. Let's give it a try. And they were like, well, it doesn't sound like something people would be interested in. I don't know. I said, OK, let us try. What do we have to lose? So we tried it. The first year, it was wonderful. It was more successful than we had ever imagined. Uh, the second year, we just got too big for Pro Musica. And they said, you know, you guys got to cut this loose because we got to concentrate on our regular concerts. We can't spend all our, you know, energy and, and time looking at this. But it was growing, so we needed to handle it. And that's when we separated from them and uh, started our own festival. There is uh, prejudice. Say, Baroque music should be boring, but they don't, they cannot, they say, well, what is Baroque music? And they cannot really tell me what it is. And I tell them, well, you know, Vivaldi's Four Seasons is Baroque. They go, really? Well, um, there is a, I guess, the, the problem is the, the semantics. Many people think of classical music and they, do, and, the, and they think Baroque music as something different or something which is not classical music or, I think there are a lot of misconceptions. Um, it made a lot of sense to have the Baroque festival and there was definitely a demand for that. The Baroque music also fulfilled a very important role, which I think we need to, to learn from and take. The first year of the, of the festival, we had only four musicians coming from out of town and four musicians from Guanajuato. And uh, about 80% to 90% of the people who bought tickets to the concerts were foreigners living in San Miguel. Uh, many of them people who supported Pro Musica since, since it was part of Pro Musica. So Pro Musica actually... Um, had a cultivated audience. Yeah, they, they have a very loyal audience and uh, they kind of marketed the, the festival to their audience and it was mainly in San Miguel. Um, the last, you know, by the year 2011, 2012, this was in 2007, by the year 2012, about 80% of the people attending the festival were tourists coming from out of town. And we were basically making a point that cultural tourism is the best kind of tourism for a city like San Miguel. It's a tourism, first of all, that spends money. It's a tourism that comes here because they love the city and they want to protect it. They don't come here to party and destroy it. They come here to enjoy and protect. And they create a virtuous circle uh, because we also use the Baroque Festival for educational opportunities to try to get children and young people here involved in cultural activities. One of the things that we made a very good point was that all of our volunteers would be young Mexicans as opposed to retired foreigners. Um, we wanted the face of the Baroque Music Festival to be the new generation of San Miguel Mexicans. And at the same time they were learning, they didn't know anything about Baroque music, but they were doing their social service and some of their school assignments to the Baroque Festival. And we always gave them lectures, of course, free entrance to the concerts. And uh, I was just so happy to see how a lot of young girls were in love with a Tiorbo player who came from Italy. This, this guy, I, I, guess, I guess he was good looking since all the girls were after him. But, you know, everybody knew what a Tiorbo was. <laughs> uh, all the 
high school girls knew what a Tiormu was. And not only that, <laughs> but they loved the music and they were open to listening to that music. And they learned something about their own history. Um, in the year 2010, the Baroque Festival dedicated the festival to Mexican Baroque music because it was the bicentennial of Mexico's independence. And, and we commissioned actually musicological work in order to put together programs of Baroque music uh, kind of presenting Mexican history basically on the book of culture, the book of arts and culture, which is a, 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 the best history book that you can possibly find because it's not written by the winners or losers of any particular battle. It's not written by politicians. It's actually the book of deeds. It's what society achieved. And that cannot be tempered with, it cannot be uh, misunderstood, it's very clear. I mean, I can tell you a lot about the history of San Miguel just by looking at the parroquia. And, and there are no heroes, there are no evil people. It is the achievement of San Miguel that we have the parroquia. So by having young people involved in this, they learn from the experience. And I think that was part of it. Uh, it, it, it continues. Uh, we no longer market it for a number of reasons as a festival for foreigners, but uh, we still try to market. We just had some concerts two weeks ago, and we were happy that more than half of the people came from Mexico. We have a lot more Mexicans than foreigners uh, in our concerts. And, and I'm talking heavy duty Baroque music. I'm talking about uh, John Dowland and, and uh, uh, Monsieur de Saint Colomb, uh, not the Yopi Four Seasons or the things that everybody knows. And I was just so happy to see these Mexicans coming to discover uh, that music. Um, you mentioned about a cultural center, and there is a link to the Baroque Festival, and that's why I wanted to talk about the Baroque Festival a little. The cultural center is, by the time we came, it was urban legend. Um, we were not the first people who used that space for culture. This In is Obraje. That's correct. Yeah. Obraje was used by Gilberto Munguia, who is another pillar of culture in San Miguel, and I do hope you interview him. He speaks perfect English. And, I know. Yeah. and definitely, I mean, he. Uh, he can tell you a lot about the history of culture in San Miguel. He himself had a chamber festival that we used to call, by the time we came, and I, and I think we came late, it was called the Winter Chamber Festival, to differentiate it from the summer festival that to this day still exists and is now called the uh, San Miguel International mm -hmm. Festival. Um, the Winter Festival was really his creation and uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, they played at Obraje. I think it was Gilberto Munguia who realized that this old building, a storage place, it was a granary at some point, and then it was used to store cotton for the uh, Aurora factory uh, at, the, at the beginning of the 20th century, that this space had beautiful acoustics. That I mean, if you play music there, it's perfect. And it's perfect because it is a Baroque building and it has the materials and dimensions of the places that were used to present music in the late 17th, early 18th centuries. And those were the spaces. I mean, if you watch movies and they want to recreate a concert from the, you know, the time of, uh, Louis XIV or Louis XV or Louis XVI, the spaces that you would see would be very similar, almost identical to O'Brien. And I do not know if it was because for that reason or just because he entered the building and he just clapped and said, this is perfect acoustics. They were having the, the, the Hilberto Munguias' festival concerts in that space. And I believe the owner of the space died in the early 1990s and his state went to his children and for reasons that I think Gilberto should probably discuss with you and not us, 
Gilberto eventually moved the festival to churches, first to churches and then to the Angela Peralta Theater. And when we came to San Miguel in 1999, that was the state of things. Basically, the winter festival, which was a wonderful festival, since we would come and spend New Year's Eve in San Miguel, we would actually come to this concert that Gilberto organized, and they were usually at the San Francisco Church or at the Angela Peralta. Um, and people talked about Obrahe, but it was urban legend by then. And like, where is Obrahe? Mm -hmm. Where? I mean, everybody says it was wonderful, and then we walked it and we saw this abandoned building and we said, could that be it? Could that be the infamous or famous Obrahe concert hall? Um, and then we looked through the windows and we saw that it had been converted to offices. They had basically put partitions and there were desks and computers in there. And that's the way it was when we came. And so we didn't believe that was it. Move forward a few years, we start the Baroque Festival, and in the year 2009, we decided to present the Brandenburg Concertos with original instruments. Now, one of the features of the Baroque Festival is that we're trying to match venues with music, so that, because a very important instrument when you hear music is the venue. The venue resonates in a way that can really enhance or destroy the music. If you have the right music in the wrong venue, the concert will fall flat. And, you know, just like when you sing in your bathtub, that venue makes your voice, which maybe is not the best, it makes it sound very nice, because you are in the right venue. And music was written for specific venues. For example, religious church music was written for European style church acoustics. Uh, chamber music was written for a smaller room. A clavichord was supposed to be played in a living room. Uh, and if you put a clavichord in a huge concert hall, it falls flat, it doesn't fill. In fact, we, we had a, Stephen and I had an interesting experience. We went to see a baroque opera in Houston at the Houston Opera, and it fell flat. And in the program notes, they say, well, you have to understand that back in the Baroque period, the spaces were about one-fourth of the size of the Houston Opera venue. <clears throat> in a way, they were telling us, they were making an excuse why it would sound so flat, because with the small Baroque orchestra, they couldn't fill the huge volume with sound. Um, and so they realized they had the wrong venue for that particular type of opera, and it fell flat. And then we went to see a Tchaikovsky opera, I think, um, uh, the, the following day, and it was perfect. Because by the end of the 19th century, the opera houses were bigger, and you used bigger orchestras, and you used different resources, and the instruments we used metal strings that produced more volume, and it, it was just a, a different piece. So if you put a late 19th century opera in a more modern venue, it will be good. But if you put a baroque, a small baroque group in a big venue, it doesn't fall, it doesn't work. But it, it's, it's beyond not just that, because there cannot be one venue that serves every purpose. Uh, as I said, church music requires church acoustics. Uh, an orchestra requires a different kind of acoustics. A small chamber group requires a smaller place. Um, and so we had been presenting in 2007, 2008, concerts in different churches and even in private uh, houses in San Miguel. Mm -hmm. And everybody complimented on how beautiful this, the music sounded. And part of it was that we had good musicians, and part of it is that we did the right match between music and venue. And in fact, our artistic director would come the year before a festival to check the venues and adjust the programs based on the acoustics of the venue. We just couldn't find a venue for the Brandenburgs. Uh, a church wouldn't work. Church acoustics were not good for, a, for an orchestra um, like the one needed for the Brandenburgs. Uh, private home was too small for the, for the orchestra. And then we kept hearing about Obrahe 
And Stephanie, who is a great private detective, found the, the owner of Obrahim, uh, basically the son of the person who had dealt with Gilberto 15, 20 years before for Gilberto's uh, concerts back in the year 1980 something, 1990 something. And we went to talk to him and he was extremely open to the possibility and he remembered as a child going to Gilberto's concerts and he said, well, let's give it a try. And so talking about the chapel, the, the, uh, the theater and the amphitheater are part of a much bigger property. And the vision that Pablo has, and I think it's better if you talk to him and he can present the vision, is to have, is to develop that whole part of town. Now there was an abandoned hotel half built that I think was going to be Club, a, Med. A Club Med and then it was abandoned. Uh, um, and it was abandoned for more than 20 years. And that part of town was kind of going in a downward spiral. And I think he wants to rescue it. And the whole project, as I know, will include um, a green area, which will more than double all the green spaces in San Miguel. Wow. It will be open to the public. In fact, between 60 and 70% of the total land will be dedicated to an ecological park. It'll be bigger than Parque Water, isn't it? Well, much, much bigger. It's, it's going to actually blend with Charco del Ingenio to make almost like a green part of a, of a green belt around San Miguel. Uh, so we, got, we have Charco and then Charco will blend into Obraje, into a very big green space. Um, it has the hotel, which is basically taking the old project the, that was abandoned and making it happen. It will have some commercial spaces and commercial areas, cafes, uh, shops, etc. Um, some real estate developments for housing, you know, I guess higher end housing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's an integral big development. Big space, yeah. It's a big space. It will also hopefully integrate with Aurora uh -huh. as a cultural center because it's next to Aurora. So the whole area, I think, will, will make, will be an area of development which is within walking distance from the Jardim. And I think it will expand significantly the attraction of San Miguel by having this very big area that will have shops, culture, uh, theaters, galleries, art galleries in Aurora, and also the new galleries that will be part of this new center. So looking at it as an integral development is a much bigger project. The parking lot is of course needed because how can you have such a big development if you don't have parking? Well, yes. And, and the other thing is that it comes with a project that should have, could have, should have, but didn't happen, which is having parking, big parking spaces outside of the center and closing the center to traffic. And Cardo was supposed to be one of those spaces. And the original idea of Cardo is that people would leave their car there and then there would be free public transportation from Cardo to the center of town. That yeah. never happened. It never <laughs> happened because politicians bought land in the center of town and they built their own parking lots. Right up the street from the biblioteca. Yeah, next to the biblioteca. In fact, you have the Insurgentes parking lot promoted by a politician. And of course he said, no, let's bring cars here. So in fact, the same politician never implemented the public transportation that was promised from Carlo to the center. Yeah. Uh, but we have to go back to that. The center is collapsing uh, because of the heavy traffic. And it just makes a lot of sense that we go back to this idea of having parking lots in the periphery and then transportation. Pablo can tell you about it, but he envisions that you leave your car and then you slow down. Yes. He's going to have carts. Like to golf move carts? Well, golf carts, but also carts, the buggies, with, you know, by, by, with horses that will actually take you from the parking lot to the hotel oh. and to the center of town. A buggy ride. <laughs> A buggy ride, so that you come to San Miguel with the big city idea, Mexico City, and then you leave your car and then you enter different space, slower, gentler, uh, 
Quiero por uh, life. And your car was left there. That, that, that was the boundary. And then you, all those cars do not have to enter the town. Of course, the same parking lot would service the cultural center and would service the hotel. And, would and the school. The school that's there, the Vasconcelos School, which has no parking lot, Absolutely, would yes. also be using that area. So, uh, but, you know, I, I think Pablo can tell you more about the project as a whole. And part of that jigsaw puzzle, which includes parking, hotel, retail spaces, housing, cultural center. Cultural center is one of the pieces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.